Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. Before we even begin, that the book of Daniel set forth the four kingdoms that would rule the world before Christ's return. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. Rome was in power at the time of Christ, the time of Christ, when he walked the streets of Jerusalem. That's why he said, these are the last days. And that power of Rome is still in power and will remain in power until Christ comes the second time. So it is Rome that with which we have to do. Not Israel, not the Jews. It is a Roman Empire. Not a Jewish cabal. It is a Roman cabal. The New World Order is the culmination of the Roman Empire. And so... Now that God has told us the truth, and we understand the truth, let us seek to understand how Rome operates in the world. This book is about the Jesuit order, the most powerful military organization on the planet, cloaked behind robes of piety. They are the most diabolical, most powerful, most wealthy, most influential entity on the planet, and it is they and all their subordinate organizations and secret societies that are orchestrating their efforts, wittingly or unwittingly, in cooperation with the Jesuits, to bring this new world order of the papacy to pass. Satan's last hurrah, the new world order, the great deception The great deception is that Roman Catholicism is Christianity and the world is wholly deceived by it. Now let's learn more about this Roman institution called the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, they call themselves. And I'm reminded of the commandment, Take not the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Who but the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuit order, take that name in vain. Now, on the virtues of lying under oath, we're talking about the moral theology of the Jesuits. We've been talking about uh, Jesuitism in the form of probabilism and equivocation, and we're going to continue our study in the, the mental gymnastics under which the Jesuit can go to justify the most diabolical deeds ever committed on the earth. The author, P.D. Stewart, writes about the virtues of lying under oath by the Jesuits. He says, The Jesuits have perfected the art of the art of swearing falsely without sin, using what they call the rule of equivocation or mental reservation. Now, as we read this portion of the book, I want to tell my listeners, keep in mind that through the Jesuit schools who teach these tenets of Jesuitism, regicide, equivocation, mental reservation, and that it is lawful to lie, and give them uh, ways to justify their lies. These are the people that are trained by the Jesuits and placed into our government. Now, even someone who's not paying attention knows that our government lies to us on a regular basis. And so does the mainstream media. We're told to trust them, to put our affairs in their hands, but they don't respond to us. They're serving someone else, someone else's benefit. They have sworn falsely their oaths of allegiance to this country 
and allegiance to its people as servants. Where do they get this mentality? They get it from their Jesuit education. The Jesuits have perfected the art of, the art of swearing falsely without sin, using what they call the rule of equivocation or mental reservation. Jesuit Father Stott says in his Of the Tribunal of the Penitent, quote, When a crime is secret, the culpability of the crime may be denied, it being understood publicly. In other words, when a crime is secret and not public, one can deny the crime. One can justly deny the crime. If nobody knows about it, then without guilt to one's conscience, you can deny having committed a crime, as long as it's secret. Now, is, is that what God taught in his word? That's a direct violation of his word. Institutionally, the Roman Catholic Church violates all ten of God's commandments. Institutionally. And this is proof. This is just one example of how the Roman Catholic Church and its diabolical Jesuit order violates every single one of God's commandments. The author continues, he says, as Pascal said, this doctrine is most useful when the Jesuits are in difficult circumstances. Quote, for by it they can say one thing and mean another. Applying this ethical teaching to any case of crime or outrage and how impossible to get a witness to convict a criminal. Unquote. So if lying is taught as the rule rather than the exception, by the Jesuit order, how would one get a witness to come forward to testify against a crime? Now, read what the learned Jesuit Guri, one of the great doctors of the Roman Catholic Church, a Jesuit priest by the name of Alphonse Guri, says on this very score, quote, Amand promised under oath to Marinus that he would never reveal a theft committed by the latter, but Amand was called as a witness before the judge and revealed the secret after interrogation. According to Gurry, he ought not to have revealed the theft, but he ought to have answered, quote, I do not know anything, understanding in his mind to mean nothing that I'm obliged to reveal. Nothing, I have, I have, I know absolutely nothing and then under his breath say to himself or within himself nothing that I'm obliged to reveal. By using a mental reservation or a mental uh, uh, restriction. So Amand has committed a grave sin against religion and justice by revealing publicly before the court a confided secret. Unquote. That's from the great Roman Catholic Jesuit Dr. Guri. I know nothing. <laughs> At least nothing that I'm obliged to reveal. <laughs> See what I mean? There, there's no, there's, there, there's no uh, morality whatsoever. These are the, the, the predominant Roman Catholic teachers. These people are create the philosophies and the practices around which the entire Roman Catholic Church is built. The author continues, he says, so it's a grave sin against religion and justice to tell the truth under oath? The teachings of De Jesuit Dr. Sanchez on the virtues of committing perjury is still more plain. Quote, listen to this. A man may swear that he hath not done a thing, though he really have, by understanding or saying within himself that he did it not on such and such a day, or before he was born, or by reflecting on some other circumstance altogether of like nature. And yet the words he shall make use of shall not have a sense of implying any such thing, and this is 
a thing of great convenience on many occasions, and is always justifiable when it is necessary or advantageous in anything that concerns man's health, honor, or estate. Have, have, you, have you ever heard such twisted morality in your life? This from another Jesuit doctor, Sanchez. If you're questioned directly about a crime that you've committed, you may equivocate any way you can not to tell the truth. Even if in answering you reserve in your mind that you didn't commit the crime on such and such a day. The judge asked you, did you rob a bank yesterday? Well, no, I didn't. <laughs> I robbed a bank two days ago. And then excuse oneself of lying. Clearing one's own conscience. Now, Felicitas confirms the above testimony. In his moral questions, he asked, quote, is it wrong to use equivocation and swearing under oath? He answers, it is not in itself a sin to use equivocation in swearing. This is the common doctrine of Sanchez, or excuse me, of Suarez, unquote. Quoting further, it says, is it perjury or sin to equivocate in a just cause? The answer again, it is not perjury as, for example, in the case of a man who has outwardly made a promise without the intention of promising. If he has asked whether he has, has promised, he may deny it, meaning that he was not promised with a binding promise. And thus he may swear, unquote. In other words, I made a promise, but I didn't intend to. It was all about my intention. Uh, how does this apply when the President of the United States stands before the cameras and millions of people and swears an oath to protect and preserve the Constitution of the United States, defend, protect, and, uh, you know, the Constitution of the United States? What, what mental reservation may he reserve within himself to exonerate himself from knowingly, before he ever swears that oath, that he is not going to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, but that he is going to serve the Pope. What mental reservation do you think that he might, what mental gyrations do you think, what acrobatics are taking place in the man's mind that while he lays his hand on the Bible, raises his right hand and swears this oath? I mean, w w <laughs> does, this, does this not explain why our government operates the way it does and the people are so perplexed? As J.A. Wiley says, quote, What an admirable lesson in the art of speaking the truth to oneself and lying and swearing falsely to everybody else, unquote. The learned Sanchez rejoins the controversy, quote, If anyone by himself or before others, whether under examination or by his own accord, for any purpose, should swear that he has not done something which he has really done, having in mind something else which he has not done, in other words, by thinking of something other than what he's really being questioned about, or some way of doing it other than the way he employed, he does not lie nor perjure himself, unquote. I mean, this is so twisted it's hard to follow when you read it. But this is the teachings of the great saints, the quote-unquote saints and quote-unquote doctors, of the Roman Catholic Church. And here's another one. St. Liguri, the great Liguri of the Roman Catholic Church, one of the great doctors of the Roman Catholic Church says this, quote, 
A prisoner, when lawfully questioned, can deny a crime even with an oath, without committing a grievous sin. If, as the result of his confession, he is threatened with punishment of death or imprisonment or perpetual exile, or the loss of all of his property or the galleys and similar punishments, by secretly understanding within himself that he has not committed any crime of, quote, such and such degree that he is bound to confess. It is permissible to swear to anything which is false by adding in an undertone, a true condition. If that low utterance can in any way be perceived by the other party, though its sense is not understood. In other words, by simply inserting in your oath, under your breath, certain words spoken to yourself, but not audible to others, which entirely changes the sense of the oath altogether. Now, Mr. President, do you promise to swear, you know, promise and swear to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States? Yeah, I do, if for at least the first five minutes. I mean, that's just how ridiculous this is. That's a demonstration. I swear to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States for the first five minutes of my tenure as president. In other words, five minutes after he lowers his hand and takes his hand off the Bible, he can violate that oath with impunity and without guilt of conscience, nor condemnation from this church called Christian, the Catholic Church. You know, what an advantage is this uh, Jesuit education? There's only 28 Jesuit universities in this country. Maybe we ought to have 56 of them. Can you hear the frustration in my voice? I mean, I don't mean to bring you down, but this is this explains what's going on in the country. These people run our government. He said, according to the confession of one pope, quote, a lie told for the purpose of misleading the enemies of the church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, is not held or regarded as a lie by Almighty God, unquote. That from the mouth of a pope. This is a doctrine maintained by more than 20 grave Jesuit doctors. He names a few of them here. Hurtado, Discatillus, Mendoza, Sanchez, Escobar, etc. That, quote, there is no mortal sin in calumniating falsely to save one's reputation. Now we're down to just saving one's reputation. It's no sin to tell a lie, to save your reputation. Does anybody wonder why they have so much trouble convicting a Roman Catholic priest of uh, pedophilia? I mean, that certainly defames the Roman Catholic Church, doesn't it? Defames the priest. Deleterious to the reputation of the Roman Catholic Church? You think that priest can lie under oath? Absolutely! It would be a crime to admit such atrocious behavior, diabolical behavior, because it puts a negative light on the church and what's more important than the church, right? So Rome, in other words, to keep them from having to testify in open court, simply move them to another diocese or another continent. <laughs> and it works. In addition to these, Jesuit fathers Emmanuel say, and Escobar advises, quote, promises are not binding 
if in making them you have no intention of keeping them. <laughs> now we're really scraping the bottom of the bucket. You can make all the promises you want if your intention is never to keep the promise. Now that really explains Washington, D.C. You commit no sin at all if you make a promise, if when you made that promise you had no intention of keeping it. <laughs> this is diabolical. It says, the learning of Cardinal Bellarmine, moreover, has been added to the list of these Jesuit equivocators. Bellarmine, the great Jesuit doctor, agrees wholeheartedly with the virtues, the quote-unquote virtues of lying under oath. Thus, the Jesuits have confessed to lying and perjury and have shown a surprising disregard for strict veracity and for telling the truth. We say to these, Jesus, uh, these Jesuits... Habemus optimum testum confitentum reum. The confession of an accused is the best evidence against him. Reading these books by these Jesuit doctors is a confession of how they operate, and it is the best evidence against a Jesuit. Their own writings the secret instructions of the Jesuits, the constitutions of the Jesuits, the writings of the great doctors of the Roman Catholic Church, they're all the best evidence one can obtain to condemn the Jesuit order in the Roman Catholic Church. And as Cardinal Fleury said, quote, it is a species of falsehood to tell the truth by halves. Unquote. But it is common fare among the Jesuits to favor lies of expediency, if such advances their cause, as though their position were exceptional, and they stood above all men with the right to use falsehoods as a means to achieve what they regard, what they regard as a good end. Remember, the end justifies the means. If you have an end in view that you can twist in your mind to be good, then any crime necessary, committed necessary to achieve that end is a good thing to do. I mean, can you imagine a more diabolical mindset than what these Jesuits have and what they teach? He says they claim that even when confirmed with an oath, Equipation is no sin because they say, we do not deceive our neighbor, but allow him to deceive himself. Thus, how can we trust a Jesuit to sit as a judge or a magistrate, a justice of the Supreme Court, or a juror, or who acts as an advisor to presidents and statesmen? As Jesuit Horner remarked, I fear the Jesuits with all their plausibilities, even when they bring gifts. And these people run our country. Be back right after this. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, 
we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We're continuing our discussion, reading and discussing the book, Code Word Barbalon. 666, Danger in the Vatican, The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination by P.D. Stewart. Book one of a two-book series, the second of which has not hit the shelves yet, but uh, the title of it is A Woman. Uh, uh, the, the Antichrist is a Woman. And I'll notify my listeners as soon as I'm aware of that book being released. I encourage my listeners to buy this book, Code Word Barbalon. And to stay tuned for the second edition, it's going to deal with, uh, among many other things, 9-11 and uh, the orchestrated economic collapse of this country. Now, we're going to continue with the book on another subject that's going to explain a lot of what we've heard in the press lately. Another moral question. Marriage and sex. What do the Jesuits teach? The author writes, So abominable are the Jesuits' teachings on the vows of marriage that one writer said that he would decline to offer, quote, any comment on the teaching of the Jesuits under the head of the Seventh Commandment, unquote, but would only say, quote, The doctrines of the society which relate to chastity are screened from exposure by the very enormity of their turpitude. In other words, the crimes that they commit in the areas of sex are so diabolical that no one dare mention them. And that's why they get by with it. Crimes so heinous that people, when they see them, 
are revolted and simply walk away. He says, we pass them as we would the open grave, whose putrid breath kills all who inhale it. The teachings of the Jesuits, everywhere deadly, is here, as it relates to chastity, a poison that consumes flesh and bones and soul, unquote. Indeed, so obscene are their writings, the Jesuit writings, on the subject of intercourse between the sexes, that were I to dare publish some of them, I would be prosecuted for outraging the public decency. Here is one permissible example. The Jesuit Sanchez writes that inchoate or incomplete sodomy is a mortal sin. Interrupted sodomy is a mortal sin. Thus the Jesuits teach that one must complete the act of sodomy once started. Sanchez further adds that it is no great sin if the husband intending to engage in lawful coitus with his wife to arouse himself thereto or procure to himself greater pleasure, sodomizes her. The act, he says, is only a venial sin. All erotically delightful coupling is permitted to spouses, unquote. And if you didn't know, a venial sin is just a light sin, no biggie. And that's... That's about all he can speak about on the subject. Because to go any deeper into the teachings of the Jesuit order regarding human sexuality is, is beyond the realm of decency. You can't even whitewash the terms enough to convey without great offense. Now, here we see that the papal church, the Roman Catholic Church, gives its penitents liberty to sin in this world and to buy their way out of purgatory and thereby escape from the punishment of having sinned. What a delusive, dastardly deception. A vain attempt to cheat the devil of the souls of willful and impenitent sinners. Do you comprehend what he's saying? The Roman Catholic Church cheats the devil of the souls of willful and impenitent sinners by teaching them it's no sin to commit these abominations. And they have a clear conscience, nothing of which to repent. More eminent and even more highly regarded is St. Alphonsin Liguri. The great Liguri, a Jesuit priest who wrote an abundance of books, this quote-unquote saint, Alphonse de Liguri, the, a doctor of the Roman Catholic Church, who was said to be a gentleman, he wrote his magnum opus, Theologia Moralis, a, a work of considerable talent but little principle. But when the Italian translation of the book was published by the Society uh, Entritis Lombarda in 1900, it was instantly sequestered by the government under the penal code as, quote, an offense against public morality. Unquote. It's diabolical. Theologia Moralis by Alphonse de Gouri, one of the great saints of the Roman Catholic Church. His work, when it 
when it was published in 1900, was immediately censored by the government as an offense against public morality. This work of Liguri is still the standard textbook used in Catholic seminaries for the training of priests taught to ask intimate and searching questions of their penitents in the confessional, and I'll just tell you especially female penitents. And for more on this subject, and I encourage you to get the book, The Priest, the Woman, and the Confessional, by Charles Chinnicky. A Roman Catholic for 50 years, who told the truth about the confessional box, and how the priests are trained to interrogate even young girls about the most secret, longings, and imaginations of their hearts. And even the questions that they ask wives, it is an eye-opener. And it says, read for yourself what St. Liguri's advice is to the Catholic priests. Quote, the most virtuous priests are constrained to fall at least once a month. That's what Liguri says about the priests. The celibate priests. Its most virtuous priests of the Roman Catholic Church are constrained to fall at least once a month. The sexual sins that are committed out of the confessional box would make a prostitute blush. The author continues, he says, constrained to fall into sexual impropriety at least once a month? You may think this is immoral, obscene, even vulgar, and you're right. To what depths will the Jesuits not sink? What other crapulent innovations in religion can we expect from these Jesuit doctors and priests? Father Charles Chinnicky, a Roman Catholic priest for 50 years, wrote, quote, I declare to the world that very few, yes, very few priests escape from falling into the pit of the most horrible depravity the world has ever known through the confession of females, unquote. But what does the professed vicar of Christ, the popes, have to say about all this? On August 28, 1879, Pope Leo XIII praised the moral theology of Liguri by recommending his works thus, quote, Although the book of the holy Dr. Alphonse Maria de Liguri, our beloved son, have already run throughout the world, the whole world, the greatest enrichment of Christianity, it is desirable that these works and others shall be still further circulated and put into the hands of all, unquote. To the greatest enrichment of Christianity... The teachings of the theology, the moral theology of Liguri, would put Playboy magazine in the ranks of a comic book for kids. And yet the Pope of Rome, Leo XIII, said it needed to be in the hands of everybody. It says the same moral degeneracy which inspired Liguri to declare that a virtuous priest is constrained to fall into sexual impropriety at least once a month led the Jesuit Guri to take pains to extend even further the moral precepts of Liguri and to perfect them in two large volumes. See his Compendium Theologia Moralis. At the time of Guri's death, the compendium had reached the sixth, excuse me, the seventeenth edition. It would be beyond all reasonable limits of decency and endurance were I to quote even one tenth of the moral maxims of these Jesuits. We could cite their doctrines ad nauseum. As the prophet Moses said, quote, 
their wine, that is their doctrine, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel gall of asps. And it is no wonder that in Revelation chapter 17 it says the whole world is drunk with the wine, the doctrine of her fornication with false gods. Yes, false gods. Catholicism is not by any stretch of the imagination the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus. He continues, he said, Yet the Jesuits insist that their principles are entirely consistent with the gospel of Christ. But who can read of those vicious villainies taught by the Jesuits of Rome without horror and astonishment? Professor Sarpy called them fine masters in the art of evil ways, an evil sent to trouble the people, and pests of the world. That translation will do well enough, but alas, we ask, if these pests are so, what shall we say of their masters? No doubt Christ would say to all of them, Thou wicked serpent, thou art accursed and hath confessed. Of thine own mouth I judge thee, of thine own mouth I condemn thee. And the Jesuits, with few exceptions, were dealing with men whose weapons are not prayers, or fastings, or tears, but perfidies, poisons, deadly maxims, leaden bullets, and gunpowder plots. By their doctrines, all that decent men call crimes, such as robberies, calumnies, murders, blasphemies, seditions, and treason, etc., flourish. In the words of one writer, quote, the Jesuit principle is the negation of all principle, and their moral code the subversion of all moral law. Yet, on the exterior, they are unsurpassed in knowledge, affable in manners, and able to be all things to all men. But these Jesuits, as Spanish history shows, are men in borrowed robes taking empty vows of chastity and poverty, dignified without but seething cauldrons within, full of every sort of concupiscence and equivocation, their erudition and sophistication being no more than confetti, tinsel, and a facade, adorning the deadly pit into which many innocent and well-meaning victims fall. Jesuitism is the devil's franchise. You want to know why this country's in trouble? Because this is the first nation in world history that ever allowed a Jesuit on its shores that didn't eventually kick them out for these very crimes. Their crimes are well known all over the world, but they are absolutely unknown in this country. One witty commentator summed up the Jesuit qualities thus. He says, unscrupulous duplicity, vicious doctrines of probabilism, mental reservation, amphibologia, that is, double-sensed words, double meanings in their words, justification of the means by the end, and many other maxims subversive to honesty and morality, unquote. And the former priest, Paulo Sarpi, says that when the Jesuits, quote, seek entrance into any place, they do not hesitate to make whatever promises may be demanded of them, possessing as they do the art of escape by lying with equivocations and mental reservations, unquote. Their cloak is religion, the fig leaf for their vicious and shameful doctrines. For despise their pretensions, these men do not watch and pray, P-R-A-Y, but watch and, uh, but watch to pray, P-R-E-Y, unquote. With a labyrinth of conceits and equivocations and the most uh, ghostly counsel, 
They are joined together at the tails like Samson's foxes and sent into the field to wreak devastation in the midst of their enemies. Even Pope Gregory the Ninth had to admit, quote, the Jesuit foxes have various faces, but they all hang together by their tails, unquote. And as we shall shortly prove, the Society of Jesus, so-called, is a most virulent, noxious, and irreligious organization, a monument of iniquity, the home of every unclean thing, the hold of every vicious and hateful doctrine. Now this much I know, but it's not all. The moral theology of the Jesuits is a base alloy of the most pernicious doctrines, a poisoned tree bearing the fruits of good and evil, a Pandora's box from which every form of evil springs, and which Jesuit strong box it is impossible to close when once that fatal box has been opened. It was King James I, King of England, who said of the baleful Jesuit Brotherhood, quote, Impostors under a veil of piety, wolves in sheep's clothing, troublers of the public peace, men of diabolical industry, serpents, and very cockademons, that is, evil spirits, of whom all should be aware and fly from them, unquote. The aphorism of Thomas Carlyle is still true. Quote, the virtues of Jesuitism are seasoned with a fatal condiment, unquote. Nay more, Jesuitism itself is like the deadly aqua tefana, which nothing can ameliorate. Aqua tefana is a most lethal poison for which there is no antidote. As Tertullian said in the second century, heroic Marcion, quote, more audacious than Amazon, more deceitful than the Eister, more craggy than the Caucasus, the true Prometheus, unquote. Such are the virtues of the men called Jesuits, the reverend casuists. These charges, be it observed, are not my views, says the author. They come from the lips and the pens of those who know the Jesuits well including many of their own former pupils and ex-brethren. Is that not good enough proof for you? What more do you want? Well, there is more. The audacity of which would surprise even Popeye and make Alibaba blush. Truly, this organization known as the Jesuit Order does take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Calling themselves the Society of Jesus, wearing pious robes of black, pretended submission to the Pope, the biblical Antichrist, who train our children in the most prestigious universities in this country, Teach them these diabolical maxims and practices. Steep them in so much sin that if they were to come out into the clear air of God's creation, fresh air would stink in their nostrils. And it's this Jesuit training that qualifies our our politicians to run our country and to lie with impunity, with clear consciences, with multitudes of cameras staring them in the face while they recite their diabolical lies. And at the same time convince us that we're not good Americans unless we believe their lies and fight their wars and partake of the flames that will soon devour them. Are you beginning to comprehend what a spiritual holocaust is taking place among God's people in the ecumenical churches that are seeking to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church under the guise of uniting Christianity? Christianity? 
because it's just not right that God's people ought to be divided. Come home to Rome. Come home to Papa, the Vicar of Christ. Unite with us against the common enemy, Islam. That's what it's all about. What are we going to do? Do we believe the confessions of these Jesuits, their admission of what they're all about? Or should we continue to pretend that they're pious priests? Despite their confessions. It's a Roman world, so said the prophet Daniel. It's a Roman empire. It began just before Christ was born. Christ confirmed the truth of the prophet Daniel when he said, These are the last times. This is the last empire. The times of the Gentiles will only come to an end when Rome comes to an end. These are the last, em- these are the last days, the last times. And from that time, Rome has killed God's people, starting with the crucifixion of our our Lord and Savior. And they've been killing God's people ever since. Why do we look in the future for a great tribulation? When it's been great tribulation for God's people, Ever since the time of Christ. Why look in the future for an Antichrist when he's been with us all the time? Why look for another empire? When Daniel promised us there would only be four, and the fourth would be a Roman Empire. And now take stock in the role that the United States has played in world events and ask yourself, is she not part, the most powerful and diabolical part of that fatal final Roman Empire? And then you begin to understand Revelation chapter 13. We'll talk about it more on the program tomorrow. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening.
Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.